Alright, so this is going to be a little review for Type 2. Type 2 is anybody that's working on an appliance that has a refrigerant with a boiling point of 50 all the way down to negative 50. So this is what we call high pressure appliances or there's some that are very high pressure which we're not going to cover here but it will be coming up soon. Alright, first thing you want to do after an AC install, which you all do with your equipment, is pressurize with nitro and leak check and then where are you going to find out how much to pressurize it? Where are you going to find out how much to pressurize it? Where are you going to find out what refrigerant's in it? Where are you going to find out all the information for the unit? The data plate. The data plate. The data plate, and the data plate will have a high pressure and a low pressure. Always go with the two out of the two with the lowest of the two. So if it says 350 high, 150 low, don't pressurize it any higher than 150 PSI on the low side. Now, let's say you look at the data plate, you pressurize with nitrogen, nitrogen drops down, you see it dropping, what's that mean? Leak, you got a leak, okay? So what are you gonna use to find the leak? What's the best refrigerant that you can add to it to make the electronic leak detector go off? R22, yep, so you're gonna add trace amount, which is like somewhere between two, some books say two PSI to 10 PSI, trace amount of R22 up to maybe somewhere between two PSI to 10 PSI. You don't need to know the details, you just need to know that it's going to be R22 as your trace gas. That's the big deal with that. If they want you to add that first up to about 10 PSI, then back it up with nitrogen pressure up to the data plate's low pressure rating. All right, and then that that's set, and then let it sit. You should let it, if you could, run the unit to circulate the refrigerant and the nitrogen together for a couple minutes, and then sniff around where you think the general area of a leak is with an electronic or ultrasonic leak detector. Now, if you want to find out where the leak is for an indoor or outdoor unit, you can bag the outdoor unit and then. Stick the probe in the lowest point of the unit underneath the bag. Because refrigerant's heavier than air, it drops down. It'll come out the center of the bag. Another location is, if I had an air handler unit here, let's say this is just a regular air handler unit, and the blower's up top, this is my fan motor, and then my coil's down at the bottom, and I have a little drain line here, I would remove the drain plug before I take any panels off with the fan off, and just take my probe and shove it in the inside. Making sure that it's dry. Making sure that we're not getting our probes shoved in with a bunch of water. But if the refrigerant's leaking anywhere in this coil, it'll fall into the pan and then eventually try and work its way down to the lowest access point of the system. So that's where I could do my leak testing. And then you're gonna follow it up with the soap bubbles to pinpoint the leak. The soap bubbles are used to pinpoint the leak. That could be a test question on type two. I showed you some equipment last week one of the pieces of equipment I showed you was the open dry compressor, which is really not in use anymore. It's sort of like talking about equipment that was made before 1993, which we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the equipment that was made before 93 is not really used anymore, and the same with these open drive compressors. But the open drive has the motor external to the compressor, and because of that, with the pulley here, its most common place of leaking is the rotating shaft seal. All right, right down in here. So that it's going to sit idle sometimes when it's not in use. And be probably the most common place for a leak on an open drive compressor. Okay. Also, if I'm doing the readings like we normally do with superheat and subcooling, checking out a system, and I see this system's got a high superheat. In other words, we got a really hot temperature coming back from the suction line. Maybe it's 70 degrees when it's supposed to be 50 with a 40 degree of app coil. Then that's going to be 30 degrees of superheat. That also could mean that we have a refrigerant leak. So that's another reason why we do the superheat and subcooling to check the refrigerant charge. All right. The only time you have to fix a leak all right, is if it's got more than 50 pounds. Okay, More than 50 pounds which is most residential equipment, five, 10, 
maybe 12, 13 pounds for some of the larger stuff, but if it's got more than 50 pounds, comfort cooling means if it leaks 15% a year, it's got to get fixed. So in other words, that system, let's say it has, for math's sake, 100 pounds of refrigerant. 100 pounds of refrigerant, and if it's leaking 15 of those 100 pounds a year, they got to do a leak check, find the leak and repair it before the service tech can add any more refrigerant into the system. Commercial industrial. Thirty-five percent a year. Thirty-five percent a year. Right. Those are the definitions. Don't really need to know what those are for the test. They're not going to ask you any specific questions. Three numbers you need to know. If recovery equipment, it's ARI 740. It's got to meet a standard called ARI 740. All right. That's your recovery equipment. Three numbers you're going to need to know ARI 740, ARI 700, and ASHRAE 15. If you're working with multiple refrigerants and you're using one recovery device, you need to recover the refrigerant out of that recovery device into its own tank. So all 502 goes in a 502 tank, all 22 goes in a 222 tank. So you want to get as much of the first refrigerant out of the recovery machine as possible before you proceed with the recovery on a system that has a different refrigerant. Some R134A equipment has special hoses and connections. You want to recover in the vapor phase to minimize the loss of oil, but it's gonna take a longer time. So they tell you to recover liquid first, but you're gonna get a lot of oil out with it. Liquid speeds the recovery process, but you're gonna also get some refrigerant oil mixed in with that liquid refrigerant, and you don't wanna take all the oil out of the compressor if you're just fixing a leak. Change it out of the compressor, it's not that big of a deal, but if you're just fixing a leak, then you're probably not gonna be able to get all the oil with the refrigerant back in. Other things you can do to speed up recovery is to place the cylinder in ice. So you'll get a tub of ice and place the cylinder in it and that'll lower the pressure, which will lower the temperature, which will make the refrigerant migrate to that tank a lot easier. Plus it migrates to where it's cold anyway, so it wants to go to where it's cold. Sometimes you might have to apply heat by turning on a defrost heater or a, maybe also using some sort of heat gun or heat source. If you have a receiver, like on the smaller pieces of equipment that we started training on, you can pump the refrigerant down in the receiver for the purpose of repairing the meter device, changing the filter dryer on the liquid line, fixing a leak in the evaporator, and then you can just release the refrigerant from the receiver. A couple standards. Showed you those packets. If you got the condenser below the receiver, you're going to want to remove from the condenser outlet. So let's say I've got my AC unit here and the condenser coils here and here's my liquid line connection and then for some reason there is a receiver above the condenser. You want to recover from here at the liquid line at the condenser outlet. When the receiver is above the condenser coil. Now if you have a tall building and there's no receiver, it's just a coil. Let's say we got our condensing unit and you just got the coil here and the refrigerant then goes down to an air handler that's on the first floor and the coil's here for the air handler and then it goes back up to the compressor, which is in the center. It gets pumped out again. You want to recover from the liquid line entering the evaporator. From the liquid line entering the evaporator right there. It's right before the meter device. So they don't really consider the meter device, they just, because it's tied right to that evaporator coil, they just say, 
from the liquid line and evaporator. That way the refrigerant can get sucked down from the top of the building and you don't have to have your recovery machine up on the roof trying to pull it 10 floors up if it's up on the 10th floor and you gotta recover refrigerant from the units on the first floor. Anytime they talk about an MVAC in type one or type two, that's a motor vehicle air conditioning unit. That's not for this uh, test. Anytime you get a brand new cylinder, it's not on the test. Anytime you get a brand new cylinder, you need to recover it by evacuating it with a vacuum pump. Make sure there's no air in the system. Make sure there's no air in the tank. All right, so you wanna make sure that you start out with an empty tank. And you can use that tank to recover refrigerant without a machine. That's gonna be a system dependent process. Here's your chart for equipment that was made before 93 and then for equipment that was made after 93 and the vacuum rates you gotta get down to. Easiest way to remember this, because you can't use this chart on the test, and there is going to be at least three, up to maybe five questions regarding this chart, is to remember the 0, 4, 4, 4, 0, 10, 10, 15. You can make the chart on the scratch paper. So separate it. This is for the before 93 equipment, which like I said, there's not much around anymore. After 93 equipment. The first two are for R22 refrigerant, and the last two are for anything else that they might ask you about in type two. Any other refrigerant, that could be 11, 500, 12, any of the other refrigerants that's on the back of that PT chart that's not R22. And then they break it down even further for if the system had less than 200 pounds of refrigerant in it, or if it had more than 200 pounds. If it had less than or more than. All right, so let's do one. Say I got a piece of equipment that was manufactured in 1992. That's what I look at the data plate of the manufacturing unit, the stamp of the equipment. All right, so it says it was made in 1992. I walk up to a piece of equipment. I look at the nameplate. Nameplate says it's R22 refrigerant and it's got 300 pounds of refrigerant. What is this equipment got to get down to in a vacuum before I can open the system for repair? Four, four inches in mercury, because we got 300 pounds, R22, before 93. 493 is here, R22 is gonna be one of these two, 300's more, so yeah, four inches in mercury. That's what the question's gonna ask you. And they might not give you specific numbers, they might just let you know if it has more or less than 200 pounds. In other words, I got a system. It says it's R12, it's an old walk-in cooler, R12 cooler. And it's only got, uh, well, let's say 60 pounds of refrigerant in it. Big cooler though, all right? Old R12 walk-in cooler. And I got a brand new recovery equipment that was manufactured in 2016. What's the vacuum level that equipment's gotta get down to before I can open for repair? 10, yeah, because it's after 93, all right, and then we got 60 pounds of a other refrigerant. So other's gonna be here, 60 pounds, you have 10, okay? And then just for giggles, let's say I've got R11 system, and it's got 350 pounds of refrigerant in it, all right, like a big commercial system. And my equipment was made also in 2016, same cover equipment, different system. What's that we're vacuumed down to? 15. 15. Yep. R11's another. Equipment was made after. And then 350 pounds is more than two. So boom. We got that. If you can get the 0444, 0, 010, 10, 15 and work this out, you don't need to know all the details. Okay, just do this. And you should be able to answer uh, the majority of questions with ease. These are easy ones that are given to you so that, you know, seven is all you can miss. Now, anytime that you pull a vacuum, let's say you pressurized it, there's no leaks, you blew, you can blow the nitrogen out, that's fine. You can even blow the trace amount of gas mixed with the nitrogen out. What you can't do is take nitrogen and add it to a fully charged system and blow it out. And then after you blow the charge, blow the, uh, yeah, the charge of nitrogen, then you're gonna pull a vacuum on the system and you're gonna make sure that it doesn't rise after it shuts off, you're gonna wait. And I don't know how the answer will be. It'll say, wait, wait a few minutes to see if the vacuum indicator rises, the pressure rises to indicate that you still might have refrigerant in liquid form. Or it could be trapped in the oil. 
which is why they tell you to heat up the compressor and tap it with a rubber mallet. Or at the very least, heat it up because less refrigerant will be contained in the oil at warmer temperatures. And they tell you to heat it up to about 130 degrees. If you can't get it down to zero, like what he's talking about with that piercing valve in the back, we're not gonna suck it down into four inches of mercury or 10 inches of mercury, no matter what the recovery equipment can do because this leak will make it unattainable. We're not getting down to that and we're sucking air in the system and it could go through the recovery machine and get into the tank. We don't wanna mix air in with the tank. Some systems, big commercial equipment has more than one compressor. They call those parallel compressor systems. Uh, could have more than one, two, three, four. Uh, anytime they tie together with a common suction header, you wanna isolate that parallel compressor in order to recover the refrigerant so it doesn't bypass back and forth. Any questions so far? Major repair, they're gonna consider the auxiliary heat exchanger coil major. We normally consider it compressor, condenser, evaporator, and a meter device, but they're gonna change out that meter device and say auxiliary heat exchanger coil. Again, you already told me, read the name plate. Filter dryer, it'll remove moisture, but it's got a limit. So if you feel temperature drop across that filter dryer, it's starting to get clogged, it needs to be replaced. Or if you have a sight glass moisture indicator and you see that the moisture indicator is changing color from dry yellow to wet when it's green, if it's starting to change to the green color, it means that you need to swap out that filter dryer. And anytime you open the system for service, you're supposed to change out that filter dryer. Anytime you put a new unit in, you're supposed to put in a new filter dryer, which is why you guys are installing them on that liquid line there. Crankcase heaters on the compressor, energize it, that again will do the warming of the oil for you and minimize any refrigerant getting trapped into it. Do not want to run the compressor when there's no refrigerant in the system or when it's in a vacuum because we're relying on that refrigerant to cool the compressor windings and if there's no refrigerant running in a vacuum the windings can overheat and then short. And then never energize a reciprocating compressor if the discharge service valve is closed. Now they mean by the discharge service valve being closed, what we call in here on this discharge service valve front seated. Because if you're running this compressor and the valve's front seated, blocking the discharge line, the refrigerant has nowhere to go. It'll blow out a gasket, damage a reed valve in the compressor, or damage other components inside the compressor. Very dangerous. Liquid charging refrigerant. Now this goes with either R11, R123, or in this case, R12. If you're dealing with a water-cooled system, I showed you a picture of that in type three. A water-cooled system, you wanna charge it with a vapor pressure of 33 PSI, because that gets you to a saturation temperature of about 32 to 36 degrees, above freezing. If you charge liquid in and it comes in contact with water that's stationary in a line, it's gonna cause that water to freeze, could cause that water to freeze, and then it's gonna burst the pipe. So we don't want that to happen. Pretty much all our stuff is done through the liquid line service valve. You want to charge through uh, that service valve and you want to charge liquid. Right. If you've got a large amount of refrigerant, liquid is quicker. Put a lot of liquid in in a short amount of time compared to trying to add vapor. Even though you put in liquid though, you're still going to have to top it off with some vapor. So you'll have to split the tank back around and maybe open the blue gauge instead of the red gauge with the unit running, you open the blue gauge. So here's the other one. We talked about ARI 740, ASHRAE 15. ASHRAE 15 says that you gotta have an alarm for your refrigerant. If you got a large equipment room, they could have refrigerant in it, and it's gotta work a vent. So we're doing two things. We're signaling an alarm so that you can vacate and ventilate all right, unless you got a self-contained breathing apparatus, an SCBA, not a scuba, but an SCBA, and that vent will kick on to the fresh air. So we're vacate and ventilate, you don't have that breathing apparatus. All right, so hear the alarm, get out. And then the fan should kick on to pull in fresh air. Any of the refrigerants that they're gonna ask you about in type two, whether it's R22, R11, R500, all those refrigerants are classified as an A1, which means they have a low toxicity rating. They're not gonna be very toxic to us. Now they are heavier than air and they displace oxygen. They can cause asphyxiation where they can suffocate you, but anything could that's not oxygen. So, but the actual toxicity of getting it on your skin and breathing in small amounts is not that harmful to the human body. And if you catch it on fire, it would not catch on fire if exposed to a flame. Now, if it does get exposed to a flame, 
the refrigerant itself becomes something else. Hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid, and phosgene gas. If you leave moisture in the system, moisture will form hydrochloric and hydrochloric acid. Think of moisture, water, hydro, hydro, and then the two chemicals that are in there. Chlorine, fluorine. So hydrochloric and hydrochloric acid can form with water or hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid can with flame. And they might ask you one question for water, one question for flame. And then they might ask you, what else does flame cause? Phosgene gas. When the chlorine burns, it turns into phosgene gas. And that's a very, it's mustard gas, very potent smell. So if you smell a strong odor when you cut a line open, chances are uh, it had a burnout. All right, you're probably gonna need to install a suction line filter dryer with that new compressor, and then you don't leave that in. You take that out in about a week or two. You cut it out, you recover all the refrigerant, and put in a piece of pipe in its place. Now, if they're asking you the refrigerant type in type three, that's R123, that's just a little more toxic than all the other refrigerants. So that's gonna be a B1. So if they're asking you this, they want you to know this chart, that they just know that 123 is a little more toxic. It still has no chance of catching on fire, but it does have a chance of harm in our body uh, a little greater than what the other A1 refrigerants are. And that's it for type two. Any questions on type two? I got one more practice test for you to do for about 20 minutes.